So let's talk about drafting. Drafting is a very important skill, especially if you're going to be communicating design to a shop that's going to manufacture your part. It's also important to think about what's important in your part and what aspects of your design correlate with how that part is going to be manufactured. Ideally, we want to get to the point where we have tried to optimize the manufacturing process with the design of the parts so the two are complementary, but that has to start with some understanding of manufacturing. A good example of this is the drawing that's in front of you right now. This is the bolt assembly, well actually this is just the bolt part from an M1 carbine. You would notice if you could look closely enough that this, the last revision of this drawing was in 1943. Now this is an F size drawing, which means it is actually gigantic when it's printed out. It's actually several feet by several feet in size. And you see all these different views that are necessary to detail all of the features that are present in this bolt. Keep in mind that this bolt would have been made with a lot of automated machinery, but none of it was CNC because CNC certainly didn't exist at the time. So you can get pretty sophisticated parts that require quite a bit of inspection to make sure that that part is functional. You can imagine that with a part this sophisticated, they wouldn't have added all sorts of dimensions for absolutely no reason. They added these dimensions and tolerances because that's what's necessary for the function of the part. So we often get the question, how do I determine what dimensions and tolerances to apply and where to apply them? And that's what I want to kind of go through an example of in this presentation. We also want to go through what details go into creating a real part drawing. Which of these details are important? How do I know what the material spec is? In this case, in, the case, in this case we can see that it's 4140 steel, spec QQ-5-64, which we can go look up if we want to. Um, lots and lots of detail here in the title block, and then just gobs and gobs of manufacturing detail and dimensional detail. How do I know how much is enough and how much is too much? A lot of that comes with experience, which I hope this can help you get started with. We also want to understand how important are all these details. Uh, is it really this important or can't I just send this 3D model to somebody who's going to manufacture it and say just make it? In reality, this document that you will create, this 2D part print, even in the midst of uh, 3D printing and the wide access to 3D modeling programs, tolerancing 2D prints is very important because this constitutes a legal contract between you and the person who's going to fabricate this or the company that's going to fabricate your part. You can imagine that if you're spending several thousand dollars for a part and it comes back and it's non-functional, hopefully your spec was sufficient to ensure function such that any part that comes back as non-functional is not your fault but the fault of the manufacturer because that's where the financial liability lies. In this case, we have to understand which details are important and which details are not, and that gives us the ability to make the part as cheap to manufacture as possible. So let's walk through this example of a main shaft from an engine. Now, I designed this shaft actually for different engine specs than what you are designing for for your uh, design project. It's not the exact same load, so you'll find that my shaft is actually uh, different dimensions than yours needed to be in order to make it work. But this is a design that I actually put through and we see quite a bit of detail on what otherwise is kind of a relatively simple shaft and we see lots and lots of stuff here and so what we want to do is go through detail by detail and I'm going to go through all of these dimensions and tell you how they came about and why I tolerance them the way that I did. So let's get started. The shaft diameter for the main sprocket here in the middle uh, is detailed right here. It's detailed in the circular face and it is one and a quarter inches, but it's plus 1.6 plus 1.0. If I'm going to go bore my sprocket out, I'm probably going to bore it right to 1.2500 on the low end. That's called using the whole basis. And so we see straight away, this is going to be a tight fit. In reality, the sprocket is going to be pressed on, which fixes its axial location. So it's going to be a tight fit. I'm probably going to have to either smack it on with a hammer or press it on with an arbor press or something similar. I want the fit not tight enough to resist torque. Torque will be carried through the keyway, so I want it to be able, I want to be able to twist it to line it up with the keyway and this, that, and the other. And press forces for assembly should be small. So I can go to Machinery's Handbook and look up what kind of fit this is. If I go to the index, I can look up shaft fits and tolerances, and it'll tell me the exact dimensions to put on this. In this case, what I want is a locational interference fit, and I want one with a lower number because it's a less interference. And so I go straight to the table in Machinery's Handbook 27th edition. I come down here to, I wanted a class LN2. 
the diameter is somewhere between 1.19 and 1.97 inches. I go over and get the diametral specs for the shaft, which is plus 1 plus 1.6 from the nominal dimension of 1 and a quarter inches. So I have 1 and a quarter plus 1 thou and 1 and a quarter plus 1.6 thou. In the ANSI standard, in, in the book, uh, in Machiner's Handbook, the standard is going to be using inches, uh, in, in this case, thousandths of an inch. And you see values shown below are given in thousandths and get cut, cut off of an inch. So the shaft diameters for the bearing interfaces, I want to press the bearings on as well. So these two smooth sections of the shaft here are going to be mounted in bearings. I'm going to be pressing on uh, ball bearings. I want single row deep groove ball bearing with a shaft diameter of 25 millimeters. Because I've drawn this in inches, I'm just going to go ahead and express this in inches, not in millimeters. 25 millimeters, obviously, just, just under uh, one inch proper. The expected loads will be normal with a fixed external ring and rotating inner ring. This is important if you read through the bearing manual and you look up the tolerance section of the technical manual, it'll actually tell you what kind of fit to apply. And so if we go to the NSK rolling bearings catalog and we go to the section on single row deep groove ball bearings, and then I can look in here and it tells me for general bearing applications, etc., cetera, uh, with a diameter from 18 to 100 millimeters, I want a K5 or K6 uh, diametral spec. And if we go back to the table that I pointed out in Machinery's Handbook, it gives you the, the ISO spec, and that's the K5, K6, JS7, um, H8 fit. These are all different classes of fit. The number uh, denotes where the tolerances are and the letter denotes the width of the tolerance. And in this case, if I go a K5 fit on this, my program will actually automatically calculate that for me in, in the case of Inventor. And so I simply applied a K5 fit to this and got 0 0.9848, 0 0.9843. And that's a slight press fit with the bearings. So we're going to have to press those the shaft diameters for the crank hub interfaces, so these two right here, these two ends, uh, actually have a little component that goes on them, but it doesn't. it's not going to be like the sprocket or the bearings. They'll be pressed on, but I need them to be removable, so I don't want it to be a permanent joint. I want the fit uh, to be loose enough that it doesn't resist torque. I want torque to be resisted by the keyway, again, so I can align the keyway as I'm pressing it on. And the hub has set screws to maintain tightness, so I don't need a whole lot of interference here. So in this case, I'm going to use a transition locational fit. Transition locational fits, as you can read in Machinery's Handbook all about it, on one end of the spectrum are tight locational fits, but they can be assembled very easily, and on the other end, they start to get into transition fits, so hence the, uh, or start to get into interference fits, hence the, the notation transition. And so I'm going to look up an LT fit. Again, in the same table that I used before in Machinery's Handbook 27th edition, and I want an LT2, uh, which is, again, not a very much interference, and in fact, not guaranteed interference, because we've got negative 0.35 thou to positive 0.35 thou. So this was on a nominal 5 eighths inch, and so I'm going to go down 0.35, up 0.35, and there's my spec. So uh, the surface finish for the bearing interfaces, again, in the bearing manual, it specifies how smooth that surface needs to be. In this case, I've specified an RA63, which is straight out of the bearing manual. Uh, they're normal class bearings between small and large. Surface will be turned on a lathe, so I can go to Machinery's Handbook and look up, okay, this is a pretty typical steel. It's a machinable steel because I can see straight away that I've spec 1045 carbon steel, and so that's decently machinable. I should be able to get a good surface finish, and so I can look up a typical surface finish attainable on a lathe, and RA63 is actually very easy to get on a lathe with a machinable material like 1045. And so I can go in to the accuracy and roughness of shaft and housing table in the NSK rolling bearing catalog and pull off small to large bearings, and it's somewhere between 0.8 and 1.6, and that's in microns, so I need to convert that to micro inches to get it into RA for my ANSI style print. And so that translates to something that an RA63 meets, and it's a very easy spec. The key seats for the crankshaft hubs uh, are detailed here and here, and the standard way of dimensioning these is to dimension from this face to the bottom of the key seat. And so for the small shaft, I've dimensioned from here to here, and that is 517, 502. And then for the, uh, the other depth of the key seat, I've detailed it here from the back of this to the bottom of the key seat. If you think about why on earth would you tolerance that way? Well, the thing that determines whether that shaft and the key together are going to fit inside the ANSI style hub is the tolerance stack between the key, which is also specified with an ANSI standard, 
and the opposite side of the shaft because whether that fits into the hole plus keyway is defined by the stack of this dimension and then the depth of that hole. And so those simply follow, again, things that are laid out in Machinery's Handbook. So here are the ANSI standard fits for parallel and taper keys, and so I can look in there and get the key seat size, which is dependent on the shaft diameter. And I go to my square key, I go to my key width, and then get the side fit and top and bottom fit tolerances for the fit range that I'm interested in. I can go get the depth control, which is this dimension S, which I've applied here and have applied uh, down here at 517, 502. And I can go get what those should be for the nominal shaft diameters. And I can do that for both the large portion of the shaft and the small portion of the shaft. And so the dimensioning approach is given in the standard and it's re reasonably easy to follow. Just pick up Machinery's Handbook, look up key seats, and uh, there's a section on dimensioning that in Machinery's Handbook. Again, for the crank hubs, the same thing. I used a section view here, so it's very clear what I'm dimensioning to. If I dimensioned in this view, it wouldn't be clear what I was dimensioning to. A, because this is hidden and we never dimension to hidden lines. B, because there are a couple of different features right in the same spot. This view gives me a nice clear view of exactly what I'm talking about. There's no question that I'm talking about this center section, so CC, and so I'm looking in this direction at it. And so if I look in that direction at CC, I can see this face and the hatch part is the part that's cut through and it's very easy to see the, the key seat dimensions that I'm applying. The chamfers and fillet radii, so I've put chamfers on the corners of each of these steps because if I'm going to press components on, a chamfer helps align that and get it, uh, make it easy to press together. So in this case, I've given a 20 thou by 45 degree chamfer, which is not a whole lot of chamfer. It's, it's uh, actually pretty small, but it's enough to keep that corner from being sharp and with the fillet radii and chamfers on my uh, bearings and sprocket respectively, they should also have some chamfer on them to, to mate up and make it easy to assemble. So I've put chamfers on all the sections of my shaft because all of them are going to require uh, some level of pressing to get things together. So you always want to provide a chamfer there. Same thing with the fillet radii, so I've detailed my fillet radii. Um, so again, chamfers are essential anywhere you're going to have a press fit. Sharp corners can cause cold welds, especially if you're using a stainless steel or you're pressing together steels that are what we would call metallurgically compatible. A lot of pressure on a single point can actually weld those two together, and now they're one solid and they're not going to come apart. So we want to avoid that high stress concentration by not allowing any sharp corners. This is also one of the reasons that we want to break Order, break corners and deburr on most of our parts unless we really need those sharp corners. Um, fillet radii in this case are limited by stress concentration and the sharpness of the corners and the parts to be pressed on. In other words, my bearings need to locate on this face and so I've made these fillet radii sharp enough that the bearing can always locate there. I got the minimum bearing radius from the bearing table and so I've got my 20 thou chamfer to allow easy pressing and then I've got my 30 thou radius that allows uh, pressing these parts on in which I've spec'd a 30 thou radius on what's going to be pressed onto it. We also look at the material spec here. I need to know what I'm going to make this out of. In this case I've specified that it's 1045 carbon steel. Fatigue is the limiting criterion for this part design. As you've probably found in your analysis, the fatigue stresses can actually get pretty significant. And it's generally governed by ultimate tensile strength, so minimum specifications for ultimate tensile strength are given. In this case, I know that there is a spec ASTM A311 that many people who are, or many companies who make 1045 carbon steel will pursue conformance with ASTM A311. There's a specification for ultimate tensile strength in there. So if I buy carbon steel, 1045 carbon steel, it says that it's uh, that it's conformant to ASTM A311, I know I'm going to get a minimum ultimate tensile strength from that, and I can rely on a pretty uh, decent assumption of fatigue strength based on that ultimate tensile strength, or I can simply specify that it's 1045 carbon steel with 80 KSI minimum ultimate tensile strength, with the, which they can get from a mill test report. Fatigue life is also limited by surface finish, so maximum roughness is specified. So I've specified a finish of RA125 all over, except as noted. And so here on this surface and here on this surface, I have denoted that I need an RA63. Otherwise, I know that I'm going to have at least an RA20, RA125, which is not terribly smooth, but it's not terribly rough. 
So as we continue to look at this print, it's easy to see that I've applied dimensions in a very particular spot. I didn't really care about the overall length of this shaft. In this particular case, this shaft is located by this face and this face where the piston rods come down and join on the part that grabs onto this part. And it's located on its interface or on the outer face here and the outer face here on the shaft or the inter interface of the, of the part. So you can take a look at that and say, wow, that I need that control to within plus or minus two thou. And that is a pretty tight tolerance. And it's tight because the con rods of this engine, if they're pushed too far out or pulled too far in, I'm going to get unnecessary wear on the pistons of my engine. So in this particular case, I need to to control that dimension, which is why that dimension is applied to that face and that face, and instead uh, I have no dimension from the end to the end, because I don't care. Likewise, if we look at this, 625 plus 1 minus 5 seems to denote that I'm alright with this being a little bit oversized, but not much. I need to restrain the size so the part that's being pressed on there locates on that face instead of that face. And so I'm alright with it being a little shorter, but longer is a no-go. Look here, I've denoted the length of the keyway from the end of the shaft to where I'm going to stop the end mill. I really don't have a good way to control the end of this fillet, or sorry, the end of this key seat, but I do have a good way to control where the mill winds up, and so I'm going to try to try to do that. To actually measure that, I would have to take a pin gauge that fits in there tightly and then find the center of that pin gauge. Uh, but I've left this as a pretty wide tolerance, so it should not be too much of an issue. Did the same thing here. Uh, you can see that I didn't apply a tolerance here, which means that I'm going to go to my title block and look up what the default tolerance value was. Title blocks usually don't have this as a matter of course in your program, whether you're using Solid Edge, SolidWorks, Inventor. Uh, you need to construct your own. And so here I've basically stated if I have three de decimal places, that's plus or minus five thousandths of an inch for a linear dimension. So this is 0 0.406 implied plus or minus 0 0.005. Likewise, I've denoted the dimension from here to here. And again, the location of these bearing faces is important. I need to make sure that it's not longer than that, but it can be, again, shorter because the way that these bearings are held in place, they're held on the outside of the bearings. And so if this is longer than it would be, then it's going to unnecessarily press those bearings into their hubs, whereas if the bearings wind up riding a little further out on the shaft, it's not that big of a deal. So linear dimensions, really any dimension, is put where it is needed for function. And so I've detailed, for example, the width of these bearing sections. Um, but I have not detailed the width of this bearing section because that width is actually non-critical. What's critical is the thing that's locating the bearings and the thing that's locating these end components. And so I've communicated that through the way that I've dimensioned my shaft. You can also notice that down here in the title block, I've got lots and lots of information. You can see that I drew it. I drew it actually two years ago in the summer. And I'm using a third angle approximation if I was using first angle, or sorry, third angle uh, view as opposed to first angle uh, projection where the views are actually kind of flipped. So you'll notice that in ISO spec prints, it'll kind of, kind of look backwards if you're used to looking at an American print. But all in all, the, the thing to take away from this is if you're applying tolerances and applying dimensions, it actually takes deliberation and it takes thought. Constructing this drawing took me the better part of about 45 minutes to an hour. And you know that, that was to do it to the point where I could take this print, send it to a machine shop, and know what I'm going to get back um, is actually functional. For students who are just new to this, getting this level of detail built in may take several hours. It may take quite a long time, but it will speed up as you get better at it. Uh, the best way to do this is to design parts, take it to somebody who's an experienced designer, and let them you know, kind of write all over the paper and say, I would change this, I would change this, why did you do this, why did you do this? And if, if you find yourself applying a dimension and thinking, I don't know why I'm applying that dimension, it should give you pause. You should be applying everything with some level of deliberation so that you can know if I'm setting that tolerance, I'm setting that dimension, I've thought about the ramifications of what if that dimension is too big, too small, etc. So this is how you communicate the crux of your work, the output, you know, coming up with the shaft diameters from the design is important, but unless you can effectively communicate that to have it made right, that's of no value. So take the time to practice this skill. If you want more resources, 
contact me, I'll get them to you.